Perfect. Okay. Oh, look at that. It's time for Cool Prints. Hey friends, it's Devin here with Make Anything, and this insane contraption here is called the Turbillon Mechanica Triaxial. And this was designed by Dan, AKA Mechanistic, on My Mini Factory, and here on YouTube. You can check out his awesome channel. And Dan is basically a mechanical engineer turned 3D print designer. He's made several crazy contraptions just like this, but I think this is the most impressive yet. It's got this mechanism that you would normally only find in the most expensive wristwatches, but he managed to scale it up and make this really fun model that's quite a build. This project was already successfully crowdfunded on My Mini Factory, but you can still download it for yourself by making a late pledge if you're up for the challenge. Dan sent it to me mostly working, but it did get beat up in the mail, so I got to rebuild some parts, and even that was really satisfying. So building this whole thing from scratch would definitely be rewarding. Anyways, while I mostly share my own prints on this channel, this was something I had to share because it's one of the craziest things I've seen done on an FDM printer in a long time. And while it does have a bit of hardware, it's got some steel springs that allow it to run for nearly an hour. It's got screws and metal pins and a couple of bearings, but for the most part, it's 3D printed. And that just goes to show how intricate and complicated you can make 3D prints. You can pull off just about anything as long as you design things in a really smart way. And Dan has certainly put a lot of thought into this design. I was really impressed with his use of PLA springs. So PLA is normally a really brittle plastic, but based on the shape that he printed these, uh, they make pretty resilient and impressive springs that control these hands right here and also the winding mechanism. So that's an awesome way to get some flexible parts just by printing really intentional thin mechanisms. I've got some prints to share today that also involve flexible parts, but rather than using PLA, I'm actually using some brand new flexible filaments. I've already shared some things printed with flexible filaments here on the channel, and there's quite a few options on the market already. From FlexFill, which is rather stiff but easier to print with, and kind of the gold standard of super flexible filaments has been this NinjaFlex TPU which is really stretchy and awesome, though you may need a direct drive printer and some fine tuning to get it to work. And yeah, this has pretty much been as flexible as you could get for a long time, but recently I've been sent some experimental filaments that kind of blow everything else out of the water. So this stuff right here is a rubber filament by Atom Stack and it's made specifically to print on this Atom Stack Cambrian printer. Not only is this stuff more soft and flexible than any other flexible filament I've tried, it's also super grippy. It's got a great coefficient of friction. So if you need anything to grip, it works really well. Now I got a pre-production unit of this printer and it's honestly not the most remarkable machine I've printed with. The rubber filament is the real star. I did run into issues with it absorbing moisture, but when dried properly, it prints quite well for such a flexible material. I first set up and tested this printer during a live stream back in December, and some of my first prints were these little thumbstick covers for my 8-bit dough game controller. I wouldn't consider myself a really aggressive gamer, but it didn't take long before I started wearing off the rubber on these thumbsticks. So that's why I decided to create these little thumbstick covers. And this rubber filament worked so well for that purpose. Not only is it super flexible that I can really stretch it over these thumbsticks and it stays on, but it's got that nice soft grippiness so that it feels really good while playing games. It's a super tiny, simple print, but it's actually improved my experience here and added some longevity to these thumbstick controllers. 
Here I have a second controller where I made thumbstick covers using another really exciting filament. This is printed using this PEBA filament that has pulverized tires mixed in. This was developed by a little startup called Shirudo in a Michelin incubator program. And again, I'm not sure if you can buy it just yet, but this stuff is really awesome and I hope it becomes available really soon. Just like the tires that went into this filament, this stuff is really durable and absorbs a lot of impact well. The people who sent me this suggested making athletic equipment or shoe soles, which would really show off the use. But I decided to start small and yeah, I made another pair of these thumbstick covers. Not only does this filament have impressive qualities, but it actually prints really well. I printed out some parts on my Sovel SV01 and SV03 printers and I had way fewer problems than I've had with some flexible filaments of the past. You can really smell that burning tire smell while you're printing with it, but I guess that just goes to show that they really put some tires into this filament. Compared to the Atom Stack rubber filament, these PEBA prints are definitely more stiff and less grippy, but it still works quite well for these thumbstick covers because of the grippy texture I modeled in there. By the way, this faceplate was printed using the multi-pass technique to combine two colors. First I printed the gold parts and then the black was printed on top of that. And by printing face down, I got this really clean graphic. This PLA print is less than a millimeter thick, so it's fairly flexible. And that's perfect here since this controller has a slightly curved face. I used spray adhesive to glue that into place and I think it looks really cool. So just like that, I've got two really awesome customized game controllers. But that's not really the full story here at all. See, the reason I have two controllers in the first place is because with this first one, well, I ended up breaking the right trigger from over gripping my controller. So I opened up this controller and I found that there were two little pins that I'd broken from uh, just squeezing the trigger too much. And my first thought was that I probably wouldn't want to 3D print a replacement for that part because if I can break the pins on an injection molded part, I'd probably do the same thing with a 3D printed replacement. So my first reaction was to reach out to customer support and they did offer to send me a replacement part. They just said it could take several months because it was coming all the way from China. So I accepted that and because I'm impatient, I bought a second controller. And then only two weeks later, I broke my second controller in the exact same way. So either I'm the buffest gamer in the world or this is a pretty common problem. And that's when I decided I should figure out a way to make a reliable replacement trigger. Now, like I said, a fully 3D printed part might not last very long, so I had to think outside of the box. And I began rummaging through my garage, and I found a steel nail. It's just a standard old nail, but it has the exact same diameter as those pins inside the controller. So that got me wondering if I could just make the pin from this steel nail and print the rest of the trigger around it. With that plan in mind, I used my calipers to get as many useful measurements as I could from the original trigger and got to work modeling a replacement in Fusion 360. Unfortunately, I'll have to speed through this section because it was a pretty messy design process with a lot of prototypes and tiny changes along the way until I got something that was both printable and very functional. So we'll just skip to the second controller and see what it took to repair this thing. Opening this controller up reveals a lot of classic tactics to make it more difficult to repair. First, we've got some hidden screws inside the battery compartment and behind this sticker. Even after we remove these four little M2.5 Torx screws, we still have to carefully pry apart the two halves of this controller. There are tools for this, but I just use guitar picks and try to find the little internal clips. It can feel pretty aggressive, but I got them apart and then opened up the controller, being especially careful with this ribbon cable. We'll actually unplug that cable and now we can focus on the broken trigger. As suspected, both pins are broken, so let's build our new part. Here's my sturdy nail with that correct diameter, 
and then I'll measure the non-broken left trigger to find the correct width of the pins, and I'll mark that on my nail. Then it's down to the garage where I'll fire up the Dremel and carefully cut my nail to size. I used a file to fine tune the measurements and then some quick sanding to really clean up those ends. Now we can print the rest of this trigger. I ended up with a two part design for ease of printing and assembly, but these parts are very small and precise. So this isn't my cleanest print ever and there is a tiny bit of support material required, but this should do the trick. Splitting the part ended up being really nice because it allowed me to print the top of the trigger with this tire filled PEBA filament for extra grippiness. This may have been my first time printing a flexible print with supports and it worked out fairly well. Now we can test the pressure fit between those parts and of course we'll insert that metal pin. Fancy. I'll test the fit here to make sure it swivels freely and then I'll install it on the other side where it snaps into place. And it's time to close this baby up. The top of the trigger snaps on after it's closed and my design has this little bumper to stop the trigger so hopefully I won't break it again. At this point, I'll plug in my controller and use the 8-bit dose software to ensure that I'm still getting that full range of motion out of this trigger and it's working great. So we'll reinstall the screws and battery and get back to gaming. By now, I've already used these controllers for a few more months and so far they haven't given me any more trouble, which is pretty awesome. Oh, and of course, I had to design a pegboard mount for these as well. This was another two-part design and it works surprisingly well. It's really easy to snap the controllers into place, but they also won't fall out on their own. And I get to show off my fancy custom controllers. It might seem silly to spend so much time and effort making these little tiny replacement triggers, but for one thing, these controllers are $50 each, and now I can make these files available online for countless others to fix their own controllers. So. I feel like it's my own little contribution to the right to repair because uh, I can't be the only one breaking these things. Plus, when I finally received my replacement part in the mail several months later, they actually sent me the wrong part. So, so much for that. It was definitely worth it. Now, I'm not trying to scare people off from getting into 3D printing and design. I know a lot of work went into this relatively simple part, but in reality, some of my most useful parts were actually really quick and easy to design. I'm using several of them on this camera that I'm using to film right now. First off, down here at the feet of my tripod, I created these really simple locks for the rubber feet. In the past, I noticed the feet unscrewing themselves into this spiky configuration, which is useful for some terrain, but definitely not great on a wood floor. These little cylinders just snap onto the thread and now they can't unscrew. Then I have this tiny print which keeps my camera monitor from unscrewing itself up here. And yet another part I designed during a live stream which screws into place to make sure I don't drop that monitor. Again. You know, listing these things out right now is making me realize how many of my prints exist solely to contain my destructive energy. That said, I do have some upgrades as well, like this carriage that connects to my camera cage, and that holds onto this Zendur power bank that I use to extend my camera's battery life by a lot. Plus, that Velcro patch lets me slap on an extra light if need be. Another mod I made for this camera cage is this little piece that just offsets the cold shoe mount for my microphone. That way I can use this top handle on my camera without bumping the mic. This tripod was also missing a little knob and the replacements sell for an unreasonable price. So I printed my own knob using a dirt cheap quarter 20 bolt instead. And it works just as well. Another simple print I benefit from almost every day is this little guide I have on the back of my Mac that makes it easier for me to blindly plug in my SD cards. 
I just glued it into place and Apple probably wouldn't do it, but it makes my life easier. Gaining the ability to customize and upgrade all the things around you is just so handy and rewarding. And I actually think one of the most underrated benefits of printing your own solutions is the pure satisfaction you get every time you use something that you've printed. Take this tray I designed for my refrigerator. The water dispenser leaks, so I made a tray that's much easier to remove, and I also covered up these unsightly calcium deposits. This may be the definition of a band-aid solution, but it does bring me some satisfaction. Here's another fun design I printed using Devin Montes Cool Gray Recycled PETG by Greengate 3D combined with a rubber part printed with that atom stack filament. And that makes this super unique guitar hanger for my bedroom. Here's a third part that hides the screws and makes it easier to install. So I'll use a stud finder and mark the screw holes with a pencil. And, well, maybe double check the position of the stud before drilling into the wall. Luckily, I was able to hide that first misplaced hole and the hanger ended up looking and working great. Here's another quick fix I designed after stepping on the handle of my dustpan in yet another act of destruction. The new handle just screws into place and it's as good as new. I was also able to screw this little print onto the brush, which allows me to snap the two parts together for tidier storage. So I snuck in a bit of an upgrade as well. The next thing to fix were these dumbbells, which had deteriorating handles. I printed new handles using SaneSmart TPU, which is a stiffer flexible filament, but really easy to print with, and kind of ideal for this fix, since the grip is compressed to keep those weights on tight. I just tore off the old handles and forced on these new ones, and these dumbbells are totally restored. So often I find that little tiny parts break on much larger and more expensive items, and sometimes the little replacement part isn't even commercially available. So in those situations, 3D printing can be a real game changer for extending the lifespan of all kinds of products. Much like the dumbbells, I replaced the grips on my pull-up bar here when the foam grips were deteriorating. On my first attempt here, I used that flex fill material and this design was printed in vase mode, meaning it's printed as a continuous spiral. That can help increase print strength, but it does limit the thickness of the part. So in this case, it resulted in something that wasn't very comfortable to hang from. So I gave it another shot with a slightly different design, and more importantly, that super grippy, squishy rubber filament. That grippiness did make it more challenging to install, but some soap and water got the job done. And this grip definitely felt more comfortable and non-slip. So I printed three more and slapped them on there. Oh yeah, back to my one-arm pull-ups. I used the same rubber filament to make these little non-slip feet for my laptop case and it works way better than the original ones that fell off. I set the bottom layer thickness to zero to expose this infill, and that helps with the adhesion using this E6000. I did the same for my OP1, and it worked super well. Plus, I kind of love this color. The stool I film from also has printed feet, but these have started to crumble after four years. So I decided to upgrade them with that Sherudo tire filled PEBA and a new design. These little tabs let me flex the feet over the metal flange and that eliminates the need for any adhesive. I'd say these came out looking nice and most importantly, they're nice and robust. I think these will last for a really long time. Besides reviving things, another awesome way to use functional printing is to actually modify or adapt things to have entirely new functionalities. That's how I created this little foot trigger for my stop motion animations. You may remember when I modded my Ender 3 to trigger photos for these fun time-lapse videos. 
And once again, I found myself modifying a remote trigger to suit my more specific needs. This time I converted it into a foot pedal trigger. And by printing in FlexFill, I was able to simplify my design to be a single solid part, which eliminates any hinges or other possible points of failure. Now I'm able to trigger photos with my feet, which keeps my hands free for animating and the camera stays completely still. Finally, here's yet another case where I needed a pretty specialized tool. Natalie got these grommets for her sewing projects, but the hand tool that came with them was kind of crummy and troublesome to use. I found these compatible dies for around $10, so I decided to try building a clamping mechanism by designing some adapters for a bar clamp I already had. I printed these in PLA and everything just press fit into place. It looked somewhat promising, but when I went for it, it didn't quite go to plan. Even when I aligned everything perfectly, the clamp just couldn't produce the force to bend those steel grommets. So in the end, I did have to buy this hand press, but even then the die I got wasn't working too well. So I made a different adapter using the hand tool by combining it with another quarter 20 bolt. Finally, we got a good result. So 3D printing still managed to save the day. So there you have about a billion more reasons why 3D printing can be so awesome. And that's all I've got for today's video, but I would love to hear from you. What was your favorite print from this video? And if you've printed functional things for yourself, what is one item you find yourself appreciating all the time? All right, well, that wraps it up for today's video. Thank you so much for making it all the way through. If you enjoyed today's cool prints, please leave a like. And if you haven't already, subscribe to see what comes up next. I'll see you in the next video. And until then, I'm Devin, this is Make Anything. And as always, stay inspired. <laughs>